Okay. And then if it's your turn to do the out cue, then I'll do it. So anyway, okay. let's start it again. Damn it. That sucks. Okay. I'm going to go back to recording on um, Ustream. Okay. Take two of the Brian and Joe radio show episode number 24. <laughs> wow. I am really, I was just so impressed with that. We Thanks got everything. for everyone hanging in there with us. Yeah, guys, Chris and Kelly, sorry about that. Kelly's also, just Chris and Kelly, you can go to the Brian Joe Show website, and right at the top of the uh, Brian Joe Show website is a link to Ustream, so you can watch Joe if you're not already. Yeah, this happened. Like, remember, we had problems with when Kelly was on last time, too. This must be a Kelly thing. I think it's all Kelly's fault. <laughs> going to blame her. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm going to mute you again, Brian, okay. on the soundboard here. WVQC, as a community radio station, serves only to open its airwaves to responsible divergent points of view. The opinions expressed during the Brian and Joe radio show do not reflect the views of WVQC, Media Bridges, its staff, or board of trustees. The opinions expressed are solely those of the hosts or the show's staff or today's guests. Thank you for listening to WVQC Cincinnati. If you'd like to join the conversation on the Brian and Joe radio show, it's easy. We have several ways. You can call or send a text message to the Brian and Joe studio line at 724-444-7444 and use call show ID 71029 or send an email right now to studio at com. You can also see Brian and Joe and chat with them in our Ustream chat room at www.ustream.tv forward slash channel forward slash the dash brian dash joe dash radio dash show wvqc is supported in part by the north side tavern located at 416 WVQC, as a community radio station, serves only to open its airwaves to responsible divergent points of view. The opinions expressed during the Brian and Joe radio show do not reflect the views of WVQC, Media Bridges, its staff, or board of trustees. The opinions expressed are solely those of the hosts or the show's staff or today's guests. Thank you for listening to WVQC Cincinnati. If you'd like to join the conversation on the Brian and Joe radio show, it's easy. We have several ways. You can call or send a text message to the Brian and Joe studio line at 724-444-7444 and use call show ID 71029 or send an email right now to studio at com. You can also see Brian and Joe and chat with them in our Ustream chat room at www.ustream.tv forward slash channel forward slash the dash brian dash joe dash radio dash show wvqc is supported in part by the north side tavern located at 4163 hamilton avenue in the heart of north side the north side tavern open until 2 30 a.m features live music nightly call 513-542-3603 to reserve their back room for your special events or find out more about upcoming shows up next, I hope you'll enjoy a skip by Pedro Sanchez. Main engine start, four, three, two, one, and lift off, lift off. It's Friday, March 5th. 2010, and this is episode number 24 of the Brian and Joe Radio Show. On today's show, we have special guest Kelly Connell talking about pornography addiction. Then, in our second segment, professor at Villanova University's Department of Political Science, Professor Matt Kerbel. And then we'll wrap things up with our regular contributor, Chris Tomlin, as we talk about a preview to this Sunday's Oscar show. That's all today, live on the Brian and Joe radio show from WVQC. Welcome to the Brian and Joe radio show. 
Brian, uh, take two. I hope you're there. I am here. Joe. Oh, yay! Nice Welcome again, everyone. This is the Brian and Joe Radio Show. I'm Brian Mueller. I'm Joe Wessels. Yeah. We do have a great show planned for you guys today. Thanks for yeah. listening. I think at the top of the show, you probably heard uh, the many different ways that you can interact with the Brian and Joe radio show. And um, I won't uh, belabor that and go through that all again. But I just want to refer everybody to our website, com. If you go there at the very top of the page, you'll see mm-hmm. a section and with all the important links and things that you, and information you need to uh, get in touch with us. So, Joe, thanks for having me. I'm watching you on Ustream as very we're recording. Good. There is, of course, a bit Howdy. of a delay. Yeah, there's a little bit but, of a delay. But I mean, I know, and, and it's it's what I had hoped to talk about at the very beginning of the show here a little bit was our um, kind of what was going on this week, but we just had a little technolo- technology hiccup where Skype crashed, which is bizarre. Uh, it's never happened. To, I've never had Skype lock up ever. Uh, that's one of the really why I was doing the, Yeah, that's why I was doing the intro. So if you're watching this on Ustream or listening on TalkShoe, um, and everything's working. You can see, see it and hear it and everything else, but for some reason, it just um, locked up. I did the intro and then went to go say hi to you, Brian. You weren't there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's kind of one of those things in radio. Fortunately, you know, we're we're uh, still recording to live. Um, there are some people joining us on the internet, but um, we, you know, we do have a great show of you today. We're very excited. Yes, um, we'll tell you a little bit more about the show uh, prior to the show. Uh-huh. We were talking a little bit about some of the things that we did, and uh, we're changing up the format a little bit. We're um, we're going to try to feature a couple guests in addition to a contributor, mm-hmm. uh, speed up the, the pace of the show, uh, make it a lot more like our original program from 2005 where we'd have yeah. guests come into the studio and have uh, two distinct segments with a community segment at the end. But, you know, so, everybody is all by their – as far as – I mean, I don't know where Chris and, and Kelly, who are, who are on the line listening right now, but they're not, uh, they're not part of the show yet – uh, but we're all in different locations, and then Matt Kerbel, the professor from Villanova, will be joining us from his office. I believe uh, if he'll be phoning in to talk to you. So we've got a whole range of people that are um, uh, everywhere. So I'm sitting here all by myself in downtown Cincinnati. Um, very excited using my new Sure microphone. Uh, it it just, great. It, thank you. I very, <laughs> feel very professional, and also I feel uh, like I can hear, I can hear myself. You know, my my headphones here, and it just sounds better. So I, I feel I'm kind of excited. I have like the um, uh, well, I was going to be crude, but I won't. Oh, like a technology uh, happy place right now. Well, you know, I except like, for the uh, beginning, I like this setup, Joe. It now feels much more permanent. Uh, people didn't know for a while there we were kind of doing this on a on a shoestring, not necessarily just a shoestring budget, but you know, really trying. Uh, you know, it was a portable studio, and uh, mm-hmm. you, you, your your studio looks great. The only thing I don't see uh, any uh, galoshes or anything by the door there. I assume the snow is all melted in Cincinnati. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much. It's pretty nice weather here right now. Uh, I think tomorrow we're looking for a high of 50 degrees. It's been sunny. Um, I feel my seasonal affective disorder is slowly lifting away. I went to the Y this morning, worked out. Um, and I, I'm sweating the, helps you. I, well, I'm, I'm sweating right now, actually, because I'm sitting actually in a pool. I think my, my chair is probably sopping wet because of the technology disaster we had at the beginning of the show. But uh, <laughs> Yeah. Skype crashing will make you sweat a little bit. But, yes. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, it's like, New Orleans. yeah, you're in New Orleans. Yes, I'm still in New Orleans. Love in New Orleans. We're yeah, gonna be here great for town. About six more weeks. Uh, the temperature here is 61 degrees today. Mm-hmm. Feels like uh, feels like uh, spring is on the way for sure. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, um, just really feeling really good today. Feeling really excited about the guests. And I do want to jump right into that. But one more yep. thing I want to mention here at the outset of the show. Joe and I have talked in recent months or uh, recent weeks, even days about uh, perhaps changing the name of the Brian and Joe show. And oh, I, I yeah. just want to pitch this out there to our audience. And sure. we'll put something up on Facebook to see if uh, we can even do a poll on our website. Oh, yeah. That'd they be like cool. the idea. It's a good idea. We wanted to take the show away from the cult of personalities that, that is Brian and Joe mm-hmm. and uh, perhaps uh, have a more generalized title because we do feature a lot of regular contributors to the show. and. Sure. Um, from time to time, we may introduce new content, new people, maybe even bring in guest hosts and things like that. And we thought, what if we call it the Coffee Shop Show? Yeah, the radio. It's it's the the radio equivalent to um, sixty minutes on the radio, like local radio and podcasting. I mean, I think that's a pretty. What do you think? Yeah, it might broaden it a little bit. I mean, sure. I'm excited about this. So we thought you could do segments like a cup of Joe, a cup. Yeah, a cup of Herman. A cup of me. A cup of, a cup of Joe or uh, a tea with a B, but you, but you uh-huh, can walk more guests into the coffee shop. But anyway, just something that we've been thinking about. Yeah. We'd love to hear your opinions. 
So yeah, please uh, do. You know, uh, post a comment on Facebook. Go to our website. Um, there's lots of places. Um, leave a call. Leave a phone. comment on our listener line too, which is at five one three four four three BJRS. You can leave a message there, and and uh, then we can even play your your comment. You could tell us how stupid that is or how great that is. Uh, you know, by doing that, and we can even play your voice on the radio. Even after, if you're listening to this as a podcast, and you think, "Well, I didn't get a chance to call in on Talk Show," um, you could you could literally just uh, still make a comment. Awesome. Well, should we get going here? Should Absolutely. We? We're eight minutes into the show, so uh, it's a, okay, so so one of the challenges of you and I being in, in, in different geographical areas. Like we're not even like, not only in the same room; we're like in completely different states. So uh, I know when we used to do this in studio, we used to uh, we we had our own sign language. We were we were very good at. But uh, yeah, the delay right. on the internet thinks it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, <laughs> but we have we have our special guest with us, and uh, her name is Kelly Connell. She's a sexuality mm-hmm. sexuality educator and consultant with her master's and soon to be hopefully a doctoral degree. Uh, so she, I think she's already well. She can tell us. I, I've, she, we've asked her this before, and I'm, I'm getting her education screwed up. But she is um, on her way to a doctoral degree. I think she already has one, but uh, Kelly can clarify that for us. Her special speciality. I can't. Special, help me out. Specialty. Right. I'm trying to say her specialty is sexuality. Her specialty is sexuality and healthcare issues, uh, and she regularly writes at sexpertkelly.com. She's a contributor to howtohavegoodsex.com and to Kelly's Corner, uh, which is at mensforte.com. Kelly also joined us in 2009 on a holiday show, and today is joining us from Michigan. In fact, uh, today Kelly is here to talk about. Porn Addiction. Kelly Connell, welcome back to the Brian and Joe Radio Show. Well, thanks. Good to be back. How are you guys? Oh, great. Fantastic. (laughs) Sorry. How are you doing? I I didn't mean to blame you for our technology issues, but there is seem to be a common thread. Yeah, I noticed you waited until I muted my microphone before you made that comment. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Kelly, I want to uh, apologize to you, too. Uh, I've been confusing you in past weeks with our uh, contributor, Kelly C. Long. Um, I think the Kelly C., uh, Long, uh, uh, she's the uh, our financial contributor. She talks. She's a CPA and financial advisor, and she's uh, talked to us on a variety of subjects. But the Kelly C. Long and the Kelly Connell somehow, you know, crossed wires in my brain, and I, I think I was putting the wrong information out on the show episodes for a while. So I apologize for that, but I want to get this straight. Kelly Connell is here, and she is a sex- sexuality educator and consultant. So mm-hmm. thanks for joining us. And well, Mayor, thank you. And Mayor may not know anything about financial advice. Exactly. Please, no financial questions for me. Please. Okay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> now we invited you today to talk about a, a really important subject. Um, you know, uh, s- something that there's not a lot of awareness, although I think uh, awareness, a broad awareness on, on this subject. But I think it's sort of creeping into the uh, the public space, the public discourse. Yeah. And that is porn addiction. And um, maybe you can speak to that uh, as far as uh, awareness of the subject. Well, Maybe you know, it's really, it's really interesting when uh, Joe said he wanted to uh, wanted me to come on and talk about porn addiction, and I started looking through some of my materials and doing a little research, and it's it's very controversial about whether or not it even exists. I mean, there's a big uh, debate of people in my field, therapists, educators in the field of sexuality, about whether it exists or not, mm-hmm. and you know, it's not in the DSM. Oh as, no as an uh, addiction or there's no definition of it in the DSM. And the DSM, uh, we've actually, this has actually come up before in the Brian and Joe radio show, even in the past couple weeks, but that is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. I can't talk. I you know, I don't even know why I do radio. Uh, <laughs> diagnostic <laughs> Statistical Manual, Joe, which I is... I watched u- American Idol this week, and they asked the American <laughs> Idols how they warmed up for the for the performances, and one, one guest, they're one of the... Does somebody just drive away? They, meow. It- they just meow, meow, meow. Meow, meow. meow. So I should probably just do that before the show starts. <laughs> meow, meow. But the DSM. So anyway, that's that's what people uh, who are in um, the field of uh, mental health use to help diagnose mental illness. So anyway, so you said it's not right. in that. It's not even in that. Right. Right. It's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, right. and it's not in there. Um, it's you know, it's very interesting about there's debate about whether or not the behavior actually indicates whether there's an addiction versus a compulsion. Uh-huh. And, you know, how are you defining whether somebody is um, addicted to pornography or not? Right. Well, where do you fall on the spectrum on that? Well, you know... Porn star or I not porn it, star? I think it goes more towards compulsive behavior. I think it's very interesting because porn is much more available now 
than with the internet. Uh huh. You know, I think there's mm-hmm. something estimated that there's over 400 million sort of quote unquote adult web pages. And so it's very easy to get in there and start watching it because more is only one click away. Yeah. You know, you can absolutely. keep clicking and clicking and clicking. And it's more private. It used to be that if you wanted to get porn, you had to go into a public place and rent a video or buy a magazine or something like that. So it's much more private now. So I think that there's people out there that are looking at porn that maybe always wanted to, but they were too embarrassed, uh, afraid to be seen going into a, a store to rent a video or something like that. Um, I mean, there's no doubt that some people's consumption of uh, porn gets them into trouble. You know, people can max out their credit cards, lose sleep, things like that. I think that's more of a compulsion. And I think, you know, where you kind of draw the line is whether or not something is harmful is, you know, if you're just, you know, looking at porn, there's th- usually three reasons people look at porn. You know, they want to see their fantasies acted out. Uh, they want to, they have tendency to avoid intimacy in a relationship or they look at it to simply a- aid in their own masturbation to get aroused and to masturbate. Um, mm-hmm. when let me, you get back, into let me trouble, back you up. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I, I hate to interrupt at this point, but I, I want to back you up a little bit and talk okay. about, um, you talked about porn addiction and, and we were, we're mm-hmm. saying, well, is, is it really recognized as an addiction or not? But you know, and I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about porn becoming more available. And the reason that one of the reasons that we decided that this was an important subject and needed to be talked about or something that we wanted to bring to our audience is that um, it, that's where my initial awareness came is that you know it is much more available on the internet. And a few years mm-hmm. ago, I bought a book. Um, I was looking for a good read, and I don't know how I stumbled upon this. I honestly don't remember. I might have even heard this on the radio um, on NPR or something like that. I bought a book called Pornified, and it was written by a, from a woman, uh, by a woman. Uh, the author is Pamela Paul. And she comes from a more feminist perspective, but she talked about how porn was infiltrating our our culture and really becoming mainstream. And I think that was my first exposure. And once I read that book, I started to question, hmm, is this a problem? Is this addiction? And I started bringing this question to friends. And I have to say mostly to male friends because male friends uh, tend to have the perspective that pornography is fine in a relationship. Um, You know, as long it's not cheating if you're using pornography. Um, Pornography is somewhat harmless. Of course, guys, too, are conditioned to think that they should have these bachelor parties and go to strip clubs and things like that. And Joe and I have talked about these issues over the years. I had a horrible um, experience at a strip club with Brian. Um, yeah, we were about 18 years old or something. That's when right? I met Brian was a stripper. No, I'm just, no. <laughs> just kidding. No, we've well, known so each that's other. The thing. You can't almost talk about this without joking. But it really it's a is kind a of, joke. yeah, yeah. It's a jokey subject. It, it, can, it can be jokey. But, it, I mean, you know, I mean. It can be sticky, too. That are addicted. Go ahead. Do you want to tell the stories? No, I said uh, I said it could be a sticky too. I was making a joke. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> so anyway, I, I I just wanted to back up a little bit, and you were okay. So and and talk about it, um, how it's co- come into awareness, and of course, over time. And this is I read this book about four or five years ago, maybe 2005 ish, and um, of course, it's come to the mainstream with Tiger Woods and what has happened with him. And there's been a lot of speculation that what's going on with him is perhaps a sex addiction, uh, um, pornography addiction. And I think if you read more literature, maybe there is a distinction, uh, distinction to be made between pornography addiction and sex addiction, addiction. But so now people are starting to talk about this more. Perhaps it's not in the DSM yet, but you were saying there's really three, three components to porn addiction. Well, no, I, there's three reasons people look at porn. Oh, you know, they want to, oh. they want to see their fantasies acted out. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have maybe some problem where they avoid intimacy in their relationship or they simply watch it to get aroused while they so they masturbate you know and that's you know alone and then you also have to consider too that a lot of couples uh look at porn or erotica however you want to define it uh together as a couple and it can enhance their relationship but it's like any kind of you know, if you can want to compare it to drugs or alcohol or something like that, I mean, when it becomes a problem is, you know, are you looking at porn so much that you can't uh, do your activities of daily living? You know, you call in sick to work because you're looking at porn so much. You can't, you know, you sure. would rather look at porn than be with your significant other. You, you know, it kind of controls your life. And that those are more signs of an addiction sort of like drugs, you know, um, Eric Jansen from the Kinsey Institute, who's done research on this, kind of criticizes the term addiction when talking about porn because he's like, it merely describes certain people's behavior as being addiction-like. 
but you know, treating them yeah. as addicts may not help them. You kind of want to get there, to underlying issues. Isn't there some literature or some research now that does say that these sorts of things, pornography, pornography addiction, especially as related to the online component, just like gaming, um, gaming is another thing that people worry about getting addicted to games like World of Warcraft, but I know we're talking about pornography or bring back to that, but um, that there are some neurological changes that go on your brain because when you're surfing porn or looking at porn, your brain releases certain chemicals uh, similar to what it would do if you were having actual sexual experiences or perhaps even doing other drugs, um, so, sort of dopamine and other things are released into the brain causing an addiction and that you need that that release that high and so you go back to the what what brought it to you before you go back to surfing porn so wouldn't from that perspective from a biological perspective it perhaps be considered an addiction well i mean there's certainly that school of thought but again not everybody agrees with it i mean there you're of course you're getting pleasure and you're getting those neurotransmitters and everything like you do when you go through the sexual response cycle if you're watching it you're getting sexually aroused and then you orgasm and all of that I mean of course you're gonna get those neurotransmitters sort of coursing through your system but I think that the question is is you know are you wanting to look at porn rather than be with your partner you know is this your only do you have a partner but you use this as your only uh, sexual outlet now, in your writing and your experience in dealing with uh, individuals and couples and things like that, have, has the question of pornography, uh, has that come up more often? And, you know, do you see it as being an issue in a, for a lot of couples or not? Well, th the issue that I have run across is uh, usually it's when the male is uh, looking at porn and the woman doesn't know about it. And then all of a sudden she catches him looking at porn on the computer or watching a video or maybe finds his magazines or something and she had had no idea he was doing this and uh, she kind of takes it as, a, as an affront that you know why does he want to do this when I'm here and I'm available yeah it, mm -hmm. that's a and, really you interesting know, and, and is looking at, and is it cheating is you know right. is looking at porn on the internet cheating uh, is interacting with somebody on the internet who's maybe sort of I don't know if I want to use the porn model or something like that, maybe right. one of these chat hosts. Is that cheating? You know, where is the line? And that's it's more of an emotional thing. Um, but it's you can also compare that to when, you know, people throw the term sex addict around. You know, when, mm -hmm. when I see people that, you know, maybe he wants sex, you know, three or four times a week and she wants sex once a week and therefore she's like, well, he's a sex addict. He just wants it all the time. Uh -huh, and that's yeah. not the case at all. They just have different libidos and, you know, there's underlying issues there. Yeah. You well, that, that's a great question too. Then, then so uh, you, you brought up a couple of different things there that, that kind of uh, struck me a little bit. One is um, when people look at porn, is that necess is that cheating? We'll just to start with that one. Is that cheating? When you if somebody looks at pornography, is that you, you consider that cheating? In a relationship. And they don't share it first with their their significant other. Is that is that is that cheating? Are you asking me what? I Yeah, think? I'm asking you what oh, you think. Okay. I mean, I mean, because I guess there's no answer on that. But what do you think? I think I think it depends on the relationship and how that's been negotiated in the relationship. You know, um, but do we talk about people, these kind of things? Some people, if they agree that they're not going to do that, and then one person does it anyway, well, then yeah, that's sort of cheating because you've you've sort of broken what you've negotiated in that relationship. But yeah. some people don't think it's cheating if if you don't have any physical contact with somebody. That what you do online, you know, if you what you look at online, what you look at in magazines or videos. No, that's not cheating. And a lot of people will say, well, you know, I'd rather have my partner, you know, look at a video or watch something online than go out and uh, be with a real person and, and have actual physical contact with somebody. So then what I'm thinking then, too, is maybe what you're saying is that this is the, the pornography maybe not necessarily is the problem, but but the, the use of it. Um, well, we can say that not even the use of it, but the the issue that it, it's it hasn't been discussed and and that there's maybe some disagreement about it that there might actually might be other problems in the relationship. Oh, definitely, I definitely think that you know um, the and also you have to consider too is that when your partner's not I mean people think that when you're in a relationship that you don't masturbate and that's not the case. You still masturbate. Your your partner's not always available or whatever. People still masturbate. And if one partner is not available and the other partner wants to masturbate and looks at porn, you know, to get aroused or get off, you know, 
I think that that's perfectly okay if they've negotiated the relationship. And also, when you look at porn, the bad thing about porn, I think, is that, unfortunately, it's how a lot of people get their messages about sex, how sex is supposed to be, how bodies are supposed to look. You know, you're not supposed to have a hair on your body. Women are supposed to be a size zero. Men are supposed to all have huge penises. I mean, if you look at how sex is depicted in porn, it's, it's, I don't think it's a lot of it's very accurate mm-hmm. as far as what people experience when they're really having sex are. But that's how right. we get our messages. Yeah. Now, I think when <laughs> just our discussion right here, um, what this brings up to me is that um, there's – there may be a debate on what is pornography, you know. A oh, lot there of people, certainly is. There's a famous Supreme Court case, I guess, uh, dealing with this maybe back Blackman. in the 50s. Yeah. Harry Blackman. He said, <laughs> what did he say to the effect? He it was said, he said I, um, I don't have a de- something like I don't have a definition for pornography or obscene, obscenity, but I know it when I see it. Yes. Which yeah. Means, you know, it's very subjective. It's, it's pretty famous, actually. That's because pretty... what one person thinks is porn or erotic or obscene, Another person may not. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, this kind of harkens back a little bit to our our, our one time uh, guest, uh, Jimmy Flint, who's a brother of Larry Flint. Unfortunately, those two are having some um, uh, some pretty serious disagreements at the moment. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> what's porn to to uh, to Jimmy Flint um, is probably going to be a little different than say like uh, Jerry Falwell. May his soul mm-hmm. rest in peace. Uh, mm-hmm. But you know, I mean, there, there, there's a very different kind of definition. I'm just, you know, Jimmy Flint. You know, lives and breathes this stuff. Makes a lot of money off of it. Uh, oh Jerry, yeah. So and Jerry Falwell and I, I brought him up because the, his brother Larry um, had a famous uh, disagreement that went to the Supreme Court over that issue. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, you know the you other. Know, go ahead, Kelly. Go ahead. Well, some people think that it's degrading to women and it objectifies women and it you know makes women be seen in a negative way and that's one argument and I certainly think that there are some. Uh, types of pornography or erotica out there that do that, but then the other flip side of that is that some women really, some feminists actually think that it's women's way of sort of reclaiming their uh, sexuality Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. you know, being able to be free and uh, participate in pornography or erotica um, that it's, you know, they're in control. Uh Now, I I, I certainly don't want to... um uh, diminish e- your experiences and your expertise in this matter, or even quell the debate. But I, I still feel I come down from a side that, uh, from a perspective that there is a porn addiction, and and I would say that maybe there is a difference between sexual addiction and pornography addiction. That they there might be some uh, distinctions in that, um, as there are in other forms of addiction. But um, I really feel like it, as a it, it's a question that maybe we need to have a lot more dialogue about. Because it is something that has been taboo for so long, and then only more recently, because of the accessibility of pornography, has um, it just sort of become ubiquitous. And when something, when you sort of take the, uh, um, you know, you open the floodgates to uh, something like pornography, and it's almost like you have to stop and go backwards and sort of ask the question and say, what is this doing to our culture? Because Joe and I have certainly heard from comments from individuals and, and, and things that you have said one of the things that you touched on is that the expectations come from por- of of what sex is supposed to be is coming from pornography and you know that's one of the things that i find most interesting but um i know i didn't really put a question in there that's more of a comment on my own part but but i am curious to know what you feel about somebody like tiger woods who it's become very public you know very famous person worldwide it has come out recently that he had multiple affairs with many different women is this an indication of porn addiction or perhaps even sex addiction? Well, I have to tell you, I'm so glad you've asked me about Tiger Woods because one of the most frustrating things through all this is I've seen all of these people interviewed uh, about Tiger Woods and there hasn't been anybody in the field of sexuality interviewed about Tiger Woods. So here, here's what I can say about Tiger Woods. Um, I think it's very interesting that everybody is jumping on the bandwagon and labeling him a, a sex addict or a porn addict or this, that, the other. And the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, you don't, nobody knows what the arrangement in that marriage was. 
Okay, I know from experience being in this field that there are all types of relationships out there. And like I think Monique just went public and said that she has an open marriage. So no, we don't know. The only people that know are him and his wife. For all we know, they had an agreement that one of them or both of them could have sex outside their marriage. And maybe the line in the sand was, you know, as long as you don't get busted and humiliate me and, and this is made public... I can live with it. You know, we don't know that. We don't know if they agreed to monogamy. We don't know what has gone on in that marriage. So, you know, I think that's one aspect that people need to keep in mind as they sit there and try to figure out Tiger Woods and his situation. Uh, you know, nobody knows. It's good far, to make the points. We only got yeah, about a minute um, left, so I just wanted to, yeah, throw out there that, so I don't want to cut you off, but we only have about a minute left. Okay. Well, as far as being a sex addict, I think that a lot of people are getting on the sex addict bandwagon just because it's the big media hype. You know, whether or not he's truly a sex addict or whether they had an open relationship or whether he's just somebody who's not capable of monogamy. And there are a lot of people out there that are not capable of monogamy, which is a whole other show. Yeah. Well, um, that's why know, we, we don't know. That's why we have you as our regular guest, a regular <laughs> contributor, right? <laughs> Thanks so much, Kelly. I, you know, really appreciate your input. Do you have any... Um Last words that you want to say, where, where would people go if they want to just pursue this topic more or learn more about this and other uh, topics about sexuality? Can you tell people? Um, I would go to the ASECT we website, the American Association for Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, um, because you can find professionals in sexuality all over the country. Uh, I'd be very careful about what you see on the Internet because there's all sorts of fly-by-night things out there about curing your porn addiction, curing your sexual addiction, and a lot of those are very value-based mm -hmm. and judgmental. Yeah. But, uh, okay. you know, I would start with a professional organization like AXECT or yep. Quad S, the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality. Yeah, great organization. Now the first one you mentioned, again, I want to put that in our show notes. That's called ASEC. Yeah. ASECT. American, Associ American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. Great. Okay, okay Kelly Connell, right. Sexuality Educator Consultant, and uh, you can find more from her at sexpertkelly.com, and she'll be on the Brian and Joe Radio Show again in the near future. Kelly, thanks a lot for being a part of the show. Okay, thanks, Thank guys. You. Okay, Thank you. take care. Right, bye. Okay, bye-bye. We have to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more of the Brian and Joe Radio Show on WVQC. W on, uh, WVQC 95.7 FM, Radio Free Cincinnati. Want to know more about the Brian and Joe Radio Show? Visit our website at www.brianjoeshow.com. If you'd like to join the conversation on the Brian and Joe Radio Show, it's easy. We have several ways. You can call or send a text message to the Brian and Joe studio line at 724-444-7444 and use call show ID 71029. Or send an email right now to studio at brianjoeshow.com. You can also see Brian and Joe and chat with them in our Ustream chat room at www.ustream.tv forward slash channel forward slash the dash brian dash joe dash radio dash show hey what's up this is justin jeffrey from 98 degrees and you're listening to the brian and joe radio show Hi, this is Brian. We're back on the Brian and Joe Radio Show, and uh, we encourage our listeners to support Media Bridges and WVQC by visiting www.wvqc.org. They make a lot of our show possible, and we thank them. Yeah, definitely thank them a lot. Uh, WVQC is a great organization, so very happy to be a part of that. Um, we're here uh, with our guest now on our second topic, which is going to be... Um, uh, about uh, the kind of going into politics, which uh, I guess sometimes pornography and politics sort of cross over, but we're not really bringing those two together uh, <laughs> today. Yeah, they, they often, I think, uh, sort of uh, combine, especially here in Cincinnati, but we won't get into that on today's show. But uh, actually, that, I thought of that during the break. That would probably make a pretty good topic at some point. Um, but... Uh, Essentially, uh, we're here now with Professor uh, Matt Kerbel. He's a professor at Villanova in uh, near Philadelphia. Uh, he's in the uh, Department of Political Science. We're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, activism online and how that's sort of like changing things over. So, uh, Professor Kerbel, welcome to the Brian and Joe Radio Show. 
good to be here. Uh, wasn't wasn't Jerry Springer once uh, mayor of Cincinnati? Jerry Springer was once mayor of Cincinnati. Yeah, and, and, oh, and well, there's your there's your connection, right? Yeah, there. there's your connection, and and you know, and and he famously um, got caught writing a check to a prostitute uh, and uh, had to resign. That's how he lost uh, his. Uh, so yeah, so sex and politics do. But you do go know, you do know that um, when he got caught writing a check for the prostitute, he was not voted back into office. But he ran in the next election and was actually elected. So the sex scandal did not end his uh, political career. No, and I have not heard him since. No, not at all. Not <laughs> at all. He was just here. Um, uh, matter of fact. Uh, what, about a week and a half ago or so, uh, doing some campaigning for a Democratic member of city council, So, who used to be a television reporter, who I actually know fairly well. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's just We can fun. talk a lot about Jerry Springer. I have some good stories, too. But, yeah. Hey, Professor Kerbal, is it all right if I call you Matt? Is that all right? Please, please do, yes. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I don't know if, Joe, if you want to start out the question, but I, I do have um, a couple questions of my own, but I'm going to let you begin since you've uh, more recently been involved with a uh, political campaign. Yeah, definitely. Well, and I don't know that Matt and I have never met each other before, um, but uh, I was, uh, I've was i been a journalist for about 10 year plus years or so, and then uh, the newspaper I worked for closed, and uh, I was asked to be a communications director on the, a congressional campaign here in Cincinnati, and we ended up unseating a... Uh, a 14-year uh, Republican incumbent, and uh, he uh, is now fighting to get his seat back. Uh, so I'm not in involved in politics anymore, but it was very eye-opening. But one thing I, I thought was very interesting, it seems like lately with the Tea Party and with um, other things, there's a, there's a, a couple guys I met uh, from, uh, they're actually students at Wright State University up here uh, near, near Cincinnati in Dayton, Ohio, uh, that they started a group called New Left Media, and they kind of go around to these Tea Party uh, events and Sarah events. Palin book signings, and they interview the people that are there who are, you know, wearing flags and, and you know, and saying that they love Sarah Palin and asking them questions about, you know, uh, where does this person stand on the issues and that. And, 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 you know, it's edited basically to show that none of these people seem to know anything about where she stands politically uh, and, and don't really support some of the issues that they stand for. So then there's a the guy, um, and I lost his name. I think it's uh, O'Keefe is his last name. Um, I didn't write that down for some reason, but. Uh, he has been showing. He, he he did a video where he went to the Acorn office and basically, um, Acorn. Um, now you know it's funny. I didn't write. I don't know what I did with my notes on the Acorn, but Acorn uh, pretty. It's become a lightning rod. It's a nonprofit organization. It does a lot of work. Under heat, yeah. yeah, it's been under heat. Republicans um, uh, don't like them. There's actually a there's actually a float here in the Mardi Gras parade, Joe, that was uh, disparaging Acorn. Oh no, kidding. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and he it's been a big topic going back to uh, the uh, 2008 election. Right. Well, they felt like that uh, Acorn had uh, done some things that were unethical at the very least, and and then uh, Congress cut some of their funding, and they've been fighting uh, basically to keep it or keep some some semblance of it for ever since. So uh, they're upset because a guy who's a Republican activist has been doing a, a did a video that basically make them look like they were trying to help a pimp and uh, you know uh, and their prostitute and that kind of stuff. So. Uh, it intrigued me, and I thought, well, we'll uh, talk about why uh, or how these these people that are kind of passing stuff off as news or how they're kind of changing the conversation and maybe kind of changing ideas. So um, that's why we're here. So, so Matt, what, what are you seeing kind of out there in, in, in uh, on the Internet and maybe other places where, where uh, ideas are being changed and that sort of thing? Well, I, I'm probably seeing a lot of what you're seeing, Joe. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. The conversation is broadening in the sense that people can uh, contribute to uh, any number of uh, of, of uh, forms of social media, social networking media, uh, and and express their ideas. And I, I I would add that to a great extent. If you want to look at the way the blogosphere is divided politically, it's really uh, it's really two separate spheres. So you have a uh, a right or conservative blogosphere, and you have a left. Or progressive blogosphere, and to a great extent, uh, the folks who uh, participate uh, online in politics are talking to other like-minded people. So, uh, so it's, it's not this great conversation across an ideological divide. It's actually many conversations going on at the same time, uh, sometimes in parallel and sometimes uh, with complete ignorance of the other conversations. But there are. Um certain online activities and, and maybe you could call them social media i guess one that first came to my attention in the uh, 2004 election was move on and those people are not so much having just a conversation with uh, like-minded people but actually getting involved in politics oh well, that's absolutely right uh and uh, move on actually goes back to uh to the clinton impeachment which right. uh, 
which is prehistoric. I mean, that's really wow. prehistoric in, 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 in Internet terms. <laughs> Uh, because right, uh, even talking about the Internet in 2004, uh, we're talking about a different beast than we would be talking about uh, in 2010. Uh, but you're absolutely right. In fact, if you look at what I call the progressive blogosphere, uh, move on and organizations like that are uh, a part of it. And I think the way to think about it, uh, if you wanted to visualize it, uh, think of it as a decentralized space. It doesn't, it, in other words, it's not hierarchical. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a single centralized hub. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we talk about uh, more traditional forms of communication like television uh, or, uh, or, or what we're doing now, uh, the communication flow is uh, one to many in the sense that on television uh, there's a single message, a single signal, and it can go out to many, many people. On the Internet, mm -hmm. it's really many to many. Uh, so you don't have this vertical structure, you don't have this central hub structure. What you have really is uh, many, many, many different nodes uh, mm -hmm. that connect to many other nodes. Now, if you look at the blogosphere itself, uh, some of those nodes are weblogs. Some of them mm -hmm. are online-based organizations like Move On or Democracy for America. Uh, so there are different ways uh, to, to hook into this vast system. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's not top down, it's not centralized, and that in turn makes possible the kind of movement politics that we've seen emerge first on the left, and now we're seeing a little bit of it on the right with the, with the Tea Party movement. Is, is it that much different now than, uh, than it was before? I mean, if, of course it's easier, and you were saying, you know, many to many, and I think sometimes we, um, I like to joke that uh, the stuff on the internet is one to none. <laughs> you said many to uh, many. Well, you know, well, you know, you know there, that's there is something to be said for that right. because if you look at the, uh, I mean, there are there are millions of blogs, and sure. most of most of those blogs are read, uh, you know, if you're lucky, by your friends and relatives. Uh, <laughs> but there right. are a relatively small number of blogs that have a tremendous influence. Right. So if you if, if you look at the whole thing, that's absolutely right. Uh, but if you look at where the action is, uh, I think it really is many to many. Yeah. Okay. You know, gotcha. And so, how, my, so my question is, though, is, is how is that changing the conversation, then? Uh, is, is that a good thing? I mean, are, are, is the electorate more informed or less informed than they ever were? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, yes, they are. Uh, the, the, the one thing about the Internet, of course, is uh, because uh, there are no gatekeepers like there are in traditional media, uh, anybody can post and anybody can respond. Uh, what you do have, though, in the, in, if, if you again, if you look at these uh, the the, uh, the weblogs, for instance, that are uh, heavily used, heavily trafficked weblogs. So on the left, for instance, that would be uh, Daily Coast would be the number one weblog, mm -hmm. just in terms of the number of hits that it gets. Uh, wow. What you've got really is uh, you have to think of it really as uh, as as an organic entity in the sense that it will uh, over time, you know, people can post anything they want. Uh, but other people can then comment on those posts. Uh, they can decide to um, uh, to take diaries, for instance. Anybody can write a diary. Uh, but then it's the community of people who read those diaries that decide whether to recommend them up so that they get more visibility or to just let them go quickly into the memory hole. So what you have over a period of time is you have this organic structure, really, uh, which is the creation of any number of minds. Uh, and over time, um, generally inaccuracies or more slanderous comments uh, tend to go by the wayside. So uh, it's a completely different model of communication uh, than what you have in traditional journalism, which is top-down, uh, and you have a right. set of editors, and they're the ones who decide what, what, what passes through the gate. And we can go on and on about... I'm sorry, go ahead, Brian. I, I totally know. No, I was going to no, say what, what, um, what that sounds like to me is like the difference between the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches you know, where you have a more top-down approach has been the more traditional approach, and the Protestants tend to, uh, you know, have more personal evangelism and diversity yeah, within I the... I, 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 think, uh, I think you can make that comparison, with the one exception that uh, the traditional model right now uh, is starting to fall out of favor. Newspapers are trying to figure out how to sustain themselves. Uh, the large broadcast networks are suffering. So uh, that's, it's, it's, it's an apt comparison. Uh, except I, I think the church is probably still doing better than traditional media. <laughs> well, they're involved in it now. They're involved in politics much more um, through through some of these new channels and things like that than probably they ever have been before. Now, I, I just really have one more part to that question or to this comment is that it seems to me as, a, as an observer um, and someone who has been somewhat involved in politics sort of personally, not professionally, 
is that the what what all this this new media um, and social media being involved in politics kind of makes the conversations a little more shrill. Um, being from uh, Cincinnati, where there's uh, you know we have snowfall in the winter, I liken it to sort of when you have a snowball fight. Sometimes you throw a snowball up in the air so you can distract your opponent, and then you nail them with the real snowball. And what it seems like to me in politics is there's a lot of these snowballs up in the air, and while we're all looking at them, the real important stuff is coming at you, you know, from different angles, and you're not prepared for it. Yeah, well, it is. It is uh, often very shrill. Uh, we live in a partisan age. If we, if you take a look at the level of discourse in Congress, for instance, uh, it's uh, in many ways uh, it mirrors what we see online, both on the right and the left. So I think that in one respect, uh, it is uh, a reflection of the moment that we live in. Uh, in another res- respect, it is uh, also a reflection of the medium. Uh, and again, I'll draw a comparison to television, uh, which is a cool medium uh, in the sense that uh, you tend to watch it passively. Uh, and you let it you let it wash over you. But uh, the internet is a hot medium, uh, which incites you to action. Uh, you know, if somebody if somebody types to you uh, in a, in an instant message or in an email in capital letters, uh, you know, you'll, you'll you'll type back, "Stop shouting at me." <laughs> well, they're not really shouting yeah. at you; they're just typing in capital letters. But it feels like they're shouting at you. That's the nature of the medium. And so it's not at all surprising that discourse in a medium like that is going to be charged. And uh, so I think that's what we're seeing. Uh, overall, I think as the, as the internet becomes more prominent in our politics, uh, we we are more exposed to this kind of uh, heated discourse. Sure, sure. It, now, you know, I'm curious. You said that we are living in a very partisan time right now. Um, as a political scientist, can you point back to other times that you know of where this is the country's been like this, and what happened? Uh, if it's true, what happened after that? Uh, yeah. Well, okay. The good news is we survived. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, I would I would go back to the very beginning. I, and if you if you if you look at the way politics worked uh, in the early part of uh, the 19th century, uh, you find something that, uh, in many important respects, resembles what we see now in cyberspace. Uh, only it happened uh, in real space, where uh, it was an extraordinarily partisan time. Uh, there was uh, no independent press to speak of, like we are familiar with today. Uh, so instead, the political parties. Uh, would publish these broadsheets, so the press was partisan, it was blatantly partisan, uh, just like for many years objectivity was considered the standard in the commercial press. Uh, if you go back mm-hmm. to the early days of the Republic, uh, that partisanship was the standard. Yeah. Uh, and in right. fact, people, people would write, they'd print, and they would say things that would <laughs> probably make a lot of what we see today look pretty mild oh. in comparison. <laughs> yeah, I mean, slander. Oh, and just horrible would stuff. Together, they'd gather, they would gather in taverns. And they would read, and they, they, these were community events, much like the kinds of communities we see developing uh, in uh, cyberspace uh, among the politically connected. Uh, so there were very similar, very big similarities between those two eras, a very, very partisan era. But the other thing that goes with it, and I, th- I think this is a, a positive, uh, is there was a fairly high level of engagement, whereas during the television era, uh, we saw the opposite. Sure. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. The... Um as you were saying that, so th- so we're sort of in a new gilded age. Is that the sort of a you know a time of new technology, but also well, we we, we may be in a new gilded age, uh, and I think you can make an argument that we are. Uh, but I I don't know if that's because of the technology. Uh, I think this uh, the the period of time that I'm talking about uh, really predates the gilded age. Uh, it's really a, it's really a period uh, where there was a tremendous amount of political mobilization. It was a period when uh, the right to vote was starting to uh, expand beyond. Uh, originally, it was only white landowning males could vote, sure. and uh, the first restriction that dropped was land ownership. So you went from having an, a basically uh, an elite selection process to a more mass-based politics, and this goes along with that, engaging people, involving people in politics. You know, and, and you know the 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 heat that you see in a lot of um, or what you read uh, in a lot of weblogs on the right and the left, uh, does have the advantage of motivating people. And, uh, you know, one of the things that is normatively good in a democracy is to have people energized. Yeah. Regardless of where where they come from, I guess, right? I mean, regardless of where they're coming from politically, what side of the spectrum, it's good to just have people engaged. So is is this... uh, um, you know, we have notoriously in this country a notoriously low um, voter, voter turnout on election day. So, um, so maybe this is a good thing. Is that your point? 
Uh, I'm saying that there are there are good things and bad things, and I think this is one of the good things. If you take a look at uh, the uh, all the people who came into the electorate for the first time uh, to vote for Obama in 2008, uh, that's you know normally a good thing for democracy to get people who are otherwise disengaged out there and, and participating in voting, and a lot of that was mobilized online. Now, I've heard in the past um, uh, it, it, that uh, you know at least prior to the uh, Obama presidency that. You know, in this battle for new media, that maybe the the more progressive liberal side is winning. Of course, you know, thinking back to 2004, um, Swift Boat definitely um, turned the tide in that election, and that was from a a white conservative uh, perspective. And then maybe maybe the progressives did have some advantages when it came uh, to the Obama election. But certainly, when you think about the the tone of politics right now, it would seem that the uh, the conservatives are really dominating the conversation again. Are there? Is this true, and are there any myths surrounding social media and, and sort of the influence that it has on politics? Well, remember, the swift voting was old media. That was, a, that was an old-fashioned uh, negative TV ad, so that's really old media. Um, if, you, if you take a look at the 2004 election, I think that the, the, the big story coming out of that election uh, was what Howard Dean was able to do, both in terms of uh, mobilizing supporters and raising money, something that had never been done yeah. uh, on the Internet, right. certainly at that, at that level before. Uh, so if you, if you look at it that way, uh, you'd have to say that, uh, you know, that the probably the more apt comparison would be uh, between new media and old media. So when you say uh, conservatives are, uh, are, are, again, dominating the discussion, uh, I mean, I think a case can be made for that. I would personally agree with that. Uh, but I think a lot of that's being done through the old media. One of the big differences between the right and the left from a media standpoint is that uh, movement conservatives have, over a very long period of time, built an extraordinarily effective communications machine and it's largely top down so this this was in place and we you probably know what i'm talking about i'm talking about uh conservative think tanks that supply ideas uh sure. traditional uh talk talk radio uh um, talk, yeah. talk radio who are right, a lot of uh conservative response to talk radio uh fox news and the like uh, when the internet emerged over the last few years this structure was in place on the right, but there's no counterpart on the left. So what happened initially was that the, um, the Internet became a piece of this larger structure. Uh, it was essentially co-opted. Now, the reason that's significant is because in order for the Internet to function most effectively and differently from television, remember, it's a totally different type of medium, mm -hmm. in order for it to function most effectively, uh, it, it, it should be decentralized like we were talking about a few minutes ago, the way you have this, this, this horizontally structured, decentralized left blogosphere. On the right, you tend to have fewer large uh, volume community websites like Daily Coast. There are very few of them. You tend mm -hmm. not to have the degree of traffic, the number of contributions in terms of diaries and comments. It's simply sure. not as traffic the same way because it's not structured the same way. Now, I don't think this was by design. I think that in many respects the left fell into this. But having mm -hmm. fallen into it, it gave them a leg up in terms of the early competition using the new media. So, and you think the right is, is picking up where they, are they, they're picking up the pieces a little bit? I don't know. Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned... Uh, They're certainly trying. Well, well here's, here's the thing. I mean, in, in, in one respect, if you take a look at the uh, special election in Massachusetts uh, just a few weeks back, uh, mm -hmm. you saw uh, an energized right wing uh, uh, behind Scott Brown raise a lot of money online. Uh, that's really the first time I've seen a camp, political candidate of the right leverage the Internet to such great effect. So that's, I think, uh, interesting and instructive. And it's important going forward to see if there are you know, more instances like that. Mm -hmm. I do think, though, that by and large, the right blogosphere is still vertically organized, and the left is still horizontally organized. And as long as that's the case, uh, the right will be able to continue to dominate the dialogue through traditional media, and the left will be ahead in terms of movement politics. Gotcha. Well, I'd cut Good it point. off right there. We're out of time. Uh, this conversation is fascinating to me, and I think we could go on for... Uh a lot longer than, than just the short time we had with you today. But but Matt uh, Kerbel from uh, Villanova University's Department of Political Science, uh, thank you very much for spending thank time Thank you. We'll have us. links to your uh, book and to yeah. you uh, on our I website. I think we mentioned that your book is... Um, um, I'm sorry, yeah, but, but the book is Net Roots, Online Progressives and the Transformation of American Politics, available on Amazon and uh, probably other places as well too, Matt? 
Uh, it is available everywhere books are available. So uh, oh, the easiest way to go would be to Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com, or uh, your favorite bookseller. Very good. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you very much uh, for being, having me. Yeah, thank you very much for being a part of the show. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll be right back with our regular contributor, Chris Tom. We're going to be talking about Oscar show this Sunday on the Brian and Joe Radio Show. We'll be right back. Follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash Brian Joe Show. Ever sit on a plane wondering, where can I hear the Brian and Joe Show now? Well, it's easy. Almost too easy. Search for us in the iTunes store and subscribe there. Also, check us out on FriendFeed. Send us an email at feedback at com Or follow us on Twitter. Look for Brian Joe Show. Also, check us out on Ustream and Talk Shoe. Or visit our website, www.brianjoeshow.com. Like Grandma and Grandpa used to play. If you'd like to join the conversation on the Brian and Joe Radio Show, it's easy. We have several ways. You can call or send a text message to the Brian and Joe Studio line at 724-444-7444 and use call show ID 71029. Or send an email right now to studio at com. You can also see Brian and Joe and chat with them in our Ustream chat room at www.ustream.tv forward slash channel forward slash the dash Brian Dash Joe Dash Radio Dash Show. This is Darren Blaze from Shake It Records, and you're listening to the Brian and Joe Radio Show. Sound can only mean one thing. Chris Tomlin is here. George Lucas is illegitimate uh, child. We should, we, I'm sorry, Joe. We should probably jump right into this segment. I know we went a little bit long. Yeah. Uh, Chris Tomlin is our entertainment expert. He's a freelance writer. He focuses on television, film, entertainment, and sports news. And he has many writing cre- credits. You'll find his those credits at ctomlin.com. You can also find him at the superb website, the Brown Tweed Society, uh, Kentucky Sports Radio. And he's also been blogging lately for CBS Sports, and we'll have all those links up at our website. So he's joining us today to talk a little bit about the 82nd Annual Academy Awards, which will be held Sunday night. Hey, Chris. Good afternoon, gentlemen. That's a quick Hi. introduction. I just want to jump into that. Um, yeah, we're so really short. We only have like today. three minutes. But who's going to win the Oscars, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's hard to say. I mean... Uh, Obviously, I think it's going to be Jeff Bridges' big year. Uh, he's kind of a loved guy out there. Finally, he did something they could give him an Oscar for. Uh, yeah, I should say that, I'm sorry, Jeff Bridges is, uh, he's up for, uh, which movie is it, A Serious Man? Uh, Crazy Heart. Crazy Heart, Crazy yeah. Heart, I'm sorry. Crazy plays, Heart. Okay. Plays it down on his luck. Uh, uh, country music singer kind of washed up who falls in love with a journalist played by uh, Maggie uh, Gyllenhaal. And also, Colin Farrell sings country music in that movie, which is kind of a, a notable accomplishment for a drunken Irishman like him. <laughs> <laughs> you mean Col- Colin, Colin Farrell? Am I getting him confused with Colin Firth, or is he... Yes. Colin Firth is a British guy. Colin Farrell is the uh, Irish uh, Hellraiser who uh, kind of has dropped off the oh. scene a little bit. Yeah, and he was having some issues there. Yeah, but <laughs> Colin Firth is also uh, nominated as an actor in a leading role, and local guy George Clooney, but you think Jeff Bridges has got it. I, th- I think that Jeff Bridges, you know, this year I think that you, you're looking at Best Actor and Best Actress who are both just coasting on goodwill, um, and we'll get to Best Actress, I'm sure, in a moment, but I think that Jeff Bridges has been kicking around so long and is so well-liked that uh, I, think he's, like, I, I think he's a shoe in All right, well, let's talk about Actress. Uh, who do you think will win the leading actress, uh, best, uh, excuse me, Academy Award? Uh, I have not seen The Blind Side, but from all accounts, uh, it looks like it's going to be a, a Sandra Bullock. Is that fascinating? Because I didn't know she was an actress. <laughs> <laughs> the, the really interesting thing is that while, while Sandra Bullock may win the Best Actress Oscar for this movie, she's also, I believe, leading uh, her uh, another movie she had out this year called All About Steve yeah, is right. uh, is racking up the Razzie Award. I know, and that's that's <laughs> what I think. I mean, she's adorable. Don't get me wrong, but uh, Speed, and then that was it. You know, I'm like, there, there ain't been nothing. What's that? Practical Magic, don't forget that. Yeah, she was practically uh, in that, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. 
You, 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 no, are you he, arguing that that's actually a good? Well, that we, we don't we we don't have time to argue that. <laughs> but anyway, no. what else? So, best picture because I want to say the best picture candidates are Avatar, The Blind Side, as we said, that was starring Sandra Bullock, District Nine, which is a sci-fi movie with a kind of a different kind of sci-fi movie, and Education, The Hurt Locker, which has gotten a lot of talk, and Glorious Bastards, which of course is um, oh, I can't think of his name off the top of my head, real quick. Uh, Tarantino. Tarantino, exactly. Excuse me, Quentin Tarantino, Precious. Uh, which which is a movie that scared me. I didn't want to see it because I thought it would be so sad. A Serious Man, Up, the animated feature, and Up in the Air with George Clooney. Which of those movies do you think is uh, likely to come out on top? Well, first of all, I think that uh, you're going to look for, you're going to see uh, supporting actor and actress in Monique and uh, Christopher Waltz from uh, Precious oh. and Inglorious Bastards, probably respectively. But, you know, they, they've added, they've had they so many movies in the in the pool this year uh, I actually think I would not be surprised to see the Hurt Locker walk away with it. Uh, mm-hmm. Although there's a big controversy right now because um, yeah, they were trying to fix at, it. Yeah, well, uh, the, one of the producers sent out an email basically saying, you know, hey, everybody, pull for us and not that five hundred million dollar uh, 3D showcase. Uh, which <laughs> is interesting because Cameron's ex-wife directed the Hurt Locker. Uh, yeah. But I just, I just think that. You know, I, I think that they've given it to James Cameron before, and I think that right now Oscar Oscars have always said, "Well, we know James Cameron can revolutionize gotcha. film. We, we've, we, he's done that. Let's give it to uh, a movie that's really solid." And I think that the Hurt Locker's uh, probably got a lot of mojo right now. Okay. Behind. Well, unfortunately, we didn't get to talk about Avatar, but we are completely way out of time. So, uh, thank you very much, Chris, for being a part of this. Hopefully, we can have you. We'll in. have you back for sure, Chris. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for listening to the Brian and Joe Radio Show. Tune in next week when our guest will be a psychologist who helps people with creative uh, uh, problems, uh, creative people who have creative problems, and then uh, talking a little bit about hiking the Appalachian Trail. So stay tuned for Hemp Rock Radio. Brian? See you, Joe. See you. Have a great weekend. Yeah, you too. See you, everybody. Have thoughts about the show? Something you want to say, but after you heard the podcast or after the show is over? That's okay. Just call or send a text message to the Brian and Joe Radio Show's listener line at 513-443-BJRS. That's 513-443-BJRS or 443-2577. The Brian and Joe Radio Show was created by Joe Wessels and Brian Mueller, who also serve as executive producers. Special thanks to Katie Finnegan, WVQC's coordinator. Our mascot is Little John Herskovich. The show is recorded around the planet and produced at the studios of WVQC-FM in Cincinnati, Ohio. If you have a show topic idea or would like to be a guest on the Brian and Joe Radio Show, send an email to producer at brianjoeshow.com or send a letter to the Brian and Joe Radio Show, P.O. Box 912 Cincinnati, Ohio, 45201. WVQC is a nearly all-volunteer-run community radio station. You clowns ought to be fired. Okay, that's a wrap. I think we got it. Let me stop recording.